The Dark Waters channel is for entertainment purposes only. Although information in these stories can be traced back to relevant and true sources, Dark Waters strongly discourages its viewers, listeners, and subscribers from visiting the site of incidents and encounters discussed or revealed on the show. In other words, we will not be held responsible if you are attacked by a dogman, molested by a Bigfoot, bitten by vampires, chased by chupacabras, abducted by aliens, accosted by the men in black, investigated or arrested by the local law enforcement, CIA, FBI, NSA, EPA, BLM, or another alphabet group, whether on U.S. soil or abroad. Thank you for tuning in, and enjoy the show. America is home to a centuries-old legend. A hominid creature, known by many names, Sasquatch, Yeti, the Woodsman, and the most popular name of all, Bigfoot. Tonight on the Dark Waters Channel, we travel into the world of Bigfoot, where Bigfoot truth seekers combine forces to share stories and encounters from around the world. Tonight we proudly present the Bigfoot Bonanza. My farm is located just south of Shreveport, Louisiana, and I inherited it from my grandfather five years ago. Since that day, I've grown the business to another level. One of the only commercial farms here that does more business than mine is Mahaffrey. And Mahaffrey is one of the powerhouses of Louisiana farm to food industry. Here on my farm, I grow everything. Pasture-raised chickens, pork, beef, vegetables. I employ 32 people and have over $4 million worth of equipment here. Needless to say... I was very nervous when all this activity began to happen. It started about three months ago when Jordan, my guy who manages everything to do with poultry, came into the house. He had this weird look on his face. Jordan is responsible for making sure everything goes well with my chickens, that the eggs are collected on time, that they get out and get exercise. He told me that as he let the chickens out for the day, he was walking around the fence line and noticed something strange. He said that he saw these tracks that look canine and that the tracks circled the perimeter of the fence and then led back into the woods. According to Jordan, these tracks were huge, and whatever it was must have been a big dog on all fours. Standing in front of me, Jordan was clearly disturbed by these prints and insisted that I come take a look. So we drove out to the spot near the chickens and walked the fence line. Initially, when he said big dog prints, I thought he was just talking about a big dog. But these prints were massive. This was like nothing I'd ever seen around my farm before. I now understood why he was so worried, but there was absolutely nothing I could do. And being crazy enough to try and track an animal that size into the woods, he's just looking for trouble. A few days passed, and Jordan forgot about the prints, and I turned my attention to this upcoming inspection that I had with the Department of Agriculture. You see, six months ago when I was going through my divorce, I fell way behind on paperwork. And luckily, I was able to talk to the inspector into giving me a reinspection, allowing me more time to submit the proper documents. It was 3 a.m. in the morning, the day of the inspection, and I had been working all night to get the reports finished and the paperwork filled out for the DOA when I heard a ruckus out at the cow pasture. See, my farm is wired for video and sound, so I went to my little video monitoring room to see what the deal was. What I saw on that camera, I couldn't believe. My cattle were all herded up against the western fence line. 300 of them, huddled together, in fear. And at the eastern side of the fence was some kind of creature. Its eyes glistened this green color on the camera, and it was huge. This thing was moving in and out of the view of the camera as it would back up to the wood line and then charge the fence. Based on this thing's size, it could have easily jumped over the fence or even ran through it. But it was like it wanted to scare the cattle. It was toying with them. Trying to figure out what to do, I decided to grab my cell phone and to open up the video app that allowed me to monitor the cameras mobily. Then I went to my closet and I grabbed my shotgun. This creature, whatever it was, was too big to confront. But I figured if I just went out back and fired a few rounds into the air, it would leave like any other animal would. Boy, was I wrong. I stepped out of the back door with my shotgun, pointed into the air, and fired while I was looking at the camera. This thing stopped turned his head in the direction of the gunfire then it starts heading in my direction only then did I get a full look at this thing as it jumped the fence and ran through the cow pasture coming straight towards me I don't know if you ever seen that movie Underworld 
when those creatures are running on all fours that's exactly what i saw it was unreal i rushed back into the house locking the door and headed into my office it was now 3 35 a.m and i would only be alone for another 10 minutes the morning crew of workers including jordan would be pulling up any minute as i sat there with my shotgun i watched this thing circle the house sniffing and somehow it pinpointed the very room that i was in that's when i heard the scratching and banging on the walls i can't express to you how terrified i was for the next nine minutes all i thought about was that i was gonna die this creature was gonna break down the wall and eat me i looked at the camera as this thing on all fours kept banging against the wall with his shoulders over and over and over again and the scratching oh my god it was something out of a nightmare looking back on it all now this thing had to be trying to intimidate or scare me because it didn't make sense if it wanted into the house it could have just ran through one of the glass doors or broken down the front door it seemed like it was forever but finally my watch beat 345 and i could hear the trucks begin to pull in the parking lot out front jordan and his crew were always the first there in the morning i watched on camera as this thing looked directly at the light of the trucks then with speed and agility unlike anything i'd ever seen before it ran off towards the back of the farm. Jordan and his men were walking around the side of the house when I came out the back door. My face must have given it all away because Jordan's first question was, Did you see it? All I could do was nod my head yes. That's when he told me about the dog man and how it had been seen all over the United States, especially in Louisiana. Jordan had me listen to several shows and that's how I found you. We've been using the powder that your guys recommended and have gone as far as to maintain a perimeter around our farm with it. I haven't seen this creature since we made the changes. However, I'm starting to hear rumors that other farms in the area are having similar problems, except for they've lost chickens and cattle. I'm even hearing about more than one of these things appearing at the same time. I hope this is my one and only time ever seeing Dogman. I'll never forget my first time seeing a Dogman. from black southern baptist and i can never forget that day it was at a revival service back in those days christian revivals were held outdoors inside tents and to paint a clear picture for you if you can imagine being outside on a hot summer day with a huge white tent set up rows and rows and rows of chairs a makeshift stage and people were heavy in the worship this is my first time going to a revival Although I had been dragged in and out of church every Sunday my entire life, I thought it was interesting. The way people worshipped out of the church was completely different than the way they worshipped in church. It was much more intense. And I could never forget the sounds of that day. The revival had started at about 3 o'clock and had gone on for hours. And right as the sun began to set and the pastor started doing the altar call to save souls, Something weird started to happen. From my position on the right-hand side of the back row, I started to hear the strange sound coming from the woods, but I wasn't sure what it was. Amen. You could hear it faintly, just above the sound of the singing. Then as the singing and the clapping stopped, I could hear it clearer. Something was growling, and growling loudly. Initially, I thought I was hearing things until my grandmother started looking in the same direction as the sound. Then others in the congregation began to look that way too. And out from the wood line stepped something I had never seen before and hoped to never see again. This thing was massive, nine feet tall, with the huge head of a wolf. Its fur was black, jet black, and its upper body had more muscles than anything I had ever seen. It just stood there, showing his teeth and growling. The people in the congregation finally caught on to it and began to run. The pastor grabbed his Bible and began to pray, repeatedly saying, Get ye behind me, Satan. Get ye behind me, Satan. Until one of the deacons grabbed him by his collar and pulled him, yanking him off the stage. Everyone ran back to their cars and fled the area. I never knew exactly what that was that I saw until I heard you on Coast to Coast AM talking about the dog man. I'm sure that not only did I see a dog man, 
for 200 other people. When I was told by my friend that you were not critical of him when he told you about his dogman experience, at first I was skeptical. However after speaking with you I realized that you are the real deal. This encounter I'm going to share with you can be verified by my 19 year old son. Both my son and I are what you call Cajuns here in Louisiana. I spend the majority of my free time hunting and fishing in the bayous of southeast Louisiana. Per our agreement I am not disclosing exactly where this happened, I still have to live and work in this area, but I will do my best to paint a clear picture of the surrounding. It was early August and my son and I had spent the entire day fishing, I have an 18 foot Aluma craft boat with a Yamaha 40 motor. On the front I mounted a trolling motor, it is a Minnesota Kota 45 pound thrust battery powered setup. The max speed on this motor with two people on my boat is 12 miles per hour through calm waters. It was just turning dark when our encounter began, the Yamaha 40 motor on my boat was noticed also my son and I always tried to get out of the bayous before dark. As expected the Yamaha 40 was stalling and slow to crank up. As I pressed the ignition she wouldn't turn over. We didn't want to flood the engine so instead we began using the trolling motor to travel along the bayou to head home. It was no big deal we had done this many of times, it did mean that a 20 minute ride through the bayou would now take an hour. We were rounding a bin near the levee when everything went quiet. My son brought it to my attention. Papa listen, he said. Everything is so quiet. There was not a sound, no birds, crickets, no fish splashing, the only sound was the steady hum of the trolling motor. In order for you to understand what happens next I have to explain the area we were in. The levee is for storm surge protection, it's 12 to 15 feet tall in spots, along this waterway. The levee is on our left hand side, on our right hand side is primary forested wetland. The bayou. But at least I got her on the phone. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Dark Waters, with another episode of Out of Left Field. And for those of you who are new, who are new to the Dark Waters channel, um, to explain to you what Out of Left Field is, it is a storytelling format that I came up with that's real free-flowing. It's very free-flowing. It's, um, it's not like the highly produced stories with... The music and the sound, well, it has music, but it doesn't have all the background sounds and everything else. It's essentially the same thing as when I do a radio interview. The same concept. It's just me telling you guys a story, not live, but as close to live as possible, right? So, it's one of the fan favorites. Hadn't done a, a one of them in a while. And just so you'll know, the reason why I end up uh, getting doing these is because there's time periods where I go through... I mean, like call after call after call after call from people. And if you don't know the way the stories, there's two ways stories appear on Adult Waters channel. Um, one is these are stories that my friends tell me that are very close friends of mine. And then there's other stories that are kind of submitted verbally to me through members of the Adult Waters family where they call my phone number and I talk to them over time. So there's three ways. And then the third way is that some of the stories from Phantoms and Monsters blog, which we have a monetization agreement with, are put on the channels as well. So some of them are super high format, like um, 
Bigfoot expedition in Alaska, killing Bigfoot, or Siege of Lock and Ranch, or then it kind of dumbs down to, you know, three scary stories, four scary stories, blah, 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 blah. And then you get out of left field, which is this. So out of left field, that's an explanation for you. Boom. So I've been talking to, um, you guys got to forgive me for the kind of heavy breathing, but it's kind of stuff I'm stuffy. I've been talking to a number of people, and I had a couple of encounters that I think are just insane, right? As you guys know, I do not like dealing with the demon possession whole demonic thing. But I did have the occasion of running into a young lady who I grew up with. She was older than me. She's definitely older than me. I think she's four years older than me, maybe five years older than me. But her brother and I used to be childhood friends. So I ran into her at Mardi Gras. Just, I mean, most random thing on the planet. And I almost didn't recognize her because she had so many tattoos and four or five children with her. And she told me that her brother was in federal penitentiary so she says hey give me your phone number my brother would like to speak to you and i'm like all right cool and i'm not giving you the guy's name i give you one of his aliases his alias is magnolia red or one of his aliases magnolia red so i give her my number come home a couple of days pass my phone rings i get a call from a correctional facility if you ever had a phone call from correctional facility you know that call is a collect call um and so i take the call and it's this guy that, man, you know, I literally grew up with. I mean, we played football in a lot across the street from my house. And um, and so we, we're just talking, you know. And he's like, man, you know what you've been up to, how you been. And I'm telling him that I'm sorry that, you know, you're in this situation. I didn't even know that he had gone up. I didn't ask him what he went to prison for because I kind of got an idea already because based on how he was as a kid, I can imagine to, you know, some of the things he did but anyway moving forward phone call one is just kind of us just chopping it up um at the end of that call he says hey man you know do you mind if i call you because it gets a little lonely in here do you mind if i write would you write back or would you send me a letter boom 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 um can you send me some magazines you know just he trying to get stuff and i'm cool with it you know because i mean he's not the only friend i have in there so he calls back two days later And he's really interested in what I'm doing. So I tell him about, you know, the Dark Waters channel. I tell him about my real estate investing. I tell him about, you know, a couple of the business ventures that I have going on. And he's like, man, you know, I'm real proud of you. You always been real smart. The whole shebang. And he says, well, I got a story for you. I'm like, well, what kind of story you got for me? Now, I didn't know that Red's grandmother was into voodoo. I didn't know that at all. I mean, I I met Red's grandmother a number of times, a number of times when we were kids, but I didn't know his grandmother was in the voodoo. And so Red goes on to tell me that um, he moved out of our old neighborhood uh, a couple of years after I moved out. And he moved to another neighborhood uptown. Now, this was his choice because he could have stayed where he was, but he wanted to he wanted to move out. And go with his half-brother, where his half-brother lived. And his half-brother lived in a very, very rough neighborhood. He moves uptown by his half-brother. And his half-brother is a dope dealer. Not just a regular dope dealer. You know, like, there's dope dealers. There's guys who sell, you know, um, there's guys who sell weed. And they might sell you an ounce of weed. You know what I'm saying? And then there's guys who's got weed, but they got, like, garbage cans full of weed at their house, right? You know, like garbage cans like the kind that you pick up leaves with you know there's guys who sell heroin then there's those guys that have kilos of drugs well these are the type drug dealers that and over time he gets into these battles with people his half brother gets killed and then four of the other people that he's working with get murdered so basically his enemies are closing in on him and red makes a deal with the demon which now guys let me pause right here because when he's telling me this on the phone i'm like why are you telling me this like why why would you even tell me this he's like well man you doing stories i'm gonna tell you you know i'm gonna tell you my story he makes this deal with a demon i will not repeat the name y'all know i don't play that foolishness but he makes this deal with this demon and his deal was that 
he will be able to run the drug trade in exchange for his soul. While I'm talking to this dude, I'm like, dog, like, because, you know, I, I guess he didn't expect me to believe him, guys. I guess he didn't expect me to, to you know, just be like, yeah. I guess he expected me to be like, nah, bro, you crazy and hang up the phone. But my first reaction is, what's the purpose of that, like, revenge and money? When somebody say, I run this, I'm the shot caller. So in his mind, he was going to be the shot caller. He the one calling shots, taking people out and making sure that he ran the streets. Well, he got what he wanted. He got what he wanted for five years. He was on top. Then on the fifth year, the fifth month, the fifth day, it's exactly how he describes it. He was sitting in a car outside one of the little corner stores, and he had just opened what we call a Hawaiian punch. I don't know if y'all ever had a Hawaiian punch. He had just opened a Hawaiian punch and started drinking. And a 13-year-old little boy that he knew walked up to him and shot him. He said the kid was scared. So the kid didn't hit him in the chest. The kid hit him in the stomach, like on the right side of his body, towards his stomach, towards his liver, and hit him in the leg. And he pulled off. He said he drove off. He was trying to drive himself to the hospital, passed out. Bam, he hits a telephone pole. Of course, emergency services come out, police, ambulances, because he's been shot and all the rest of this stuff. He's, he got all kinds of on him that he don't need. He got drugs in the car. He got unregistered firearms in the car goes into the hospital recovers from being shot ends up going to trial and going to prison what he told me was this he said yeah man i made that deal and i got what i wanted for a limited time but i never thought that i would spend the rest of my life in prison and and, and it was heartbreaking for me it really was it was heartbreaking for me because i've said so many times that you know a lot of stuff that goes on in this world is spiritual warfare and unfortunately to have somebody that i, I mean i Dude, I mean, I know this brother like I crazy. But needless to say, Red, I did your story. I don't even know if you're going to be able to chance to hear this. Uh, there's no way for me to kind of reenact your story. But Red, I did your story, man, and, and hopefully you, you'll hear it. All right. The next person I talked to, and I'm only really doing two of these. The next person that I talked to, this lady, when we first started talking, it took a little while for me to, to start trusting her because she started off telling her story. And she was excited about telling her story. And when it comes to this particular topic, which is dog, man, I find that when people are excited to tell me the story, you're normally a little bit off. Right. But it turns out that's just how she is. She's just an excitable person. Um, and considering her circumstances, I think it's amazing the type of personality that this woman has, because uh, this woman's blind. Right. And like I said, when I first started talking to her, you know, when you first start talking to a person on the phone, you'd have no freaking clue they're blind. The fact that she's blind comes out when she's telling me the story. Now, a dull man encounter happens to her when she's out with her son uh, and they're on a walking trail in Arkansas. Early in the morning, she's walking behind her son and she's 20 yards behind him. He always keeps her in, in eye shot where he can look over his shoulder and see her and he'll get ahead of her and slow down, let her catch up with him. He wants to make her feel independent. I've spoken to her and her son. 7.30 in the morning, the sun is out, it's not foggy. To describe this trail that they're walking on, as you're walking around, you kind of circle around the park, and then on the outskirts of the park, there's just these woods. So, you know, while you're walking around the park area, pretty wide open, but when you get on, on the outskirts of the park, which when you're taking your larger loop around, you kind of go into the woods, and then you come back out, and you come back out on the other side of the park. So they walk around the park, and then they get to the part of the trail where they're going into, like, the little wooded area. But it's not like woods, like some spooky, sleepy, hollow-type TV show woods. It's just walking through some freaking woods. But it's not. It's a trail that a lot of people use. As they're walking, he looks back, and he notices that she stopped, like, dead in her tracks. And so he's standing there looking at her, and he's saying to himself, well, you know, what is she doing? She normally just keeps walking and keeps up with him. From her perspective, at the same time this was happening... She told me that she was starting to hear this low rumbling growl from her left, which is the pretty much the wood line that leads into the woods. They're on a trail to the wood. On the left side, it leads deeper into the woods. On the right side, there's like trees. But if you get on the other side of those trees, you're right back in the park. Well, from her left side, she's hearing this low growling sound. And she's thinking it's a dog, right? She's like, oh, my God, I got, you know, I got a dog up on me right now. In her mind, the best thing to do was stop, try and get a sense of where it was from the sound. And she knew that if she stopped, her son would eventually turn around and see that she stopped. The growling was low, but it wasn't strong. It sounded like a regular dog. 
So she starts walking again. She's like, okay, well, at least if it moves, I'll know what I can do. So she starts walking. She hears whatever it is moving along the tree line paralleling her. And then she hears a growl again. But this time, it's strong. I mean, it's loud. Simultaneously, her son, who's ahead of her, hears the growl. So he starts running towards her because he's like, I don't know what the hell this is. From the son's description, he sees this gigantic head, freaking dog head is what he said. He said it looked like a big German shepherd head poke out from behind a tree to where you could see it on a trail. And the head was looking at his mother. Now, from her perspective, she heard the growl. She said, I got this sense. And she's like, I, I couldn't see what it was, but I felt it. She's like, I felt its intentions. And I felt like whatever this thing was, it was evil. And it was right there in front of me. So you got this head sticking out of the trees. And it's in between her and her son. Her son is jogging back towards her. And he's no more 20, 30 yards away. He sees this head. And he starts screaming at it. Hey, ah, ah, like screaming, trying to get it get his attention because he's thinking whatever this big dog is is about to freaking eat his mom the thing turns and looks at him and now you got to keep in mind this is this man's mother this is how afraid he was and he stops running he said man this thing looked at me like it was going to kill me he was like dude i ain't gonna lie i was scared of course it's the mother who ended up running this thing off she takes her walking stick and she just started swinging it and screaming. She said, I, it didn't matter. I just knew it wasn't going to take me without a fight. And son says, when she starts doing that, it looks back at her and it stares at her. Like, what the hell is this woman doing? The insane thing about this whole encounter is, as she's swinging that stick, and being as brave as you can expect a person to be under those circumstances, this thing looks at her and backs back into the wood line. And he says he watches this thing back. It doesn't turn around and walk away. It just keeps stepping backwards into the wood line. He grabs his mother by the hand. They cut through the trees. Because you got to walk around the path to get back to the park area. They cut through the trees across the park to the parking lot in the car and they leave. And they haven't been walking in that area again. To me, the story was just like, almost was like, I thought it was an exaggeration. Not even an exaggeration. To be honest, I thought the story was a lie when I first heard it based on how exciting and how excitable she was when she was telling the story. But what I've discovered about this woman, and I alluded to this earlier, is I've discovered that although she's blind and has to have a walking stick, and she's probably the most happy person that I've ever talked to. I mean, the kind of person that when she calls me, it's like, hey, Dark, what's going on? Like, raises my spirit. So, um... I can say that I'm truly honored and blessed to be able to share her encounter. I believe her encounter is 100% true. I'm happy that it worked out the way it did. And, you know, guys, I'm I kind of stray away from Dogman because I think that a lot of the stuff that comes with Dogman lately has just been straight up. I'm going to be honest with you. And then with the overreaching people, they won't call it Dogman, but they call it werewolves. And then they just put out a thousand stories that are just insane I'm very, very selective now on um, the Dogman stuff. And I have a lot of good Dogman stuff that I'm holding on to. But this one was one that I promised her that I would tell. And I, and so, my lady, that's your story. And I hope you enjoyed it because I enjoyed talking to you. And as you know, you can call me anytime. All right, guys, those are the two stories that I wanted to share with you guys for the Out of Left Field. I hope you enjoyed them. Um, what's coming up next is uh, I'm doing some Bigfoot Bonanza. That is pretty much done. Then we're going to go to some stories that I got about pterodactyls. or I don't even call them pterodactyls. I would call them thunderbirds. Some thunderbirds. And then I'm not sure what comes after that, to be honest with you guys. You know, I'm toying with I'm toying with doing my very first uh, where you take kind of like the top five, blah, blah. You know how people do the top five, blah, 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 blah. Well, taking one particular topic and taking a documentary format to kind of explain the details of what's what along with the stories and blending them in. I'm toying with doing that. I started to try and do it with dog man, but I, I just decided I didn't, I don't even want to do it. Um, and so I'm thinking about doing that with these vampire stories that are here. 
Um, the problem I have with the vampire stories is some of the stories that I have are so true and they've been vetted so much that even to put them out, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm not afraid, but I'm, yeah, I'm scared. Cause I'm afraid to put those stories out. And if I can wrap them in and, and weave them into something else, I would feel a lot more comfortable. You know, I really would feel a lot more comfortable. Um, so, yep. Yeah. But anyway, that is it for how to left field, ladies and gentlemen. I'll do a little editing to this. Not a lot. I'll add a little music to it. And then you guys will have this tomorrow.